Resurrection Bay Baptist Church, if you could all please come on in, find a seat this morning. Brother Jake and Miss Kaylee and Mr. Luke and Mr. Hayden are going to open up with a special for us. All right, here we go. Ready? Jesus is wonderful. Hang on, I forgot my cape on. I'll just go ahead. We're going to go with it. Here we go. Ready? Jesus is wonderful. Yes, he is wonderful. Jesus is wonderful. To me, he is the king of kings, prince of peace, my everything. Oh, he is wonderful to me. Yes, Jesus is wonderful to me. When I think of my sin, shame, no one but myself to blame. My soul was headed towards hell. Jesus, he went by my way, saved me that very so I'll lift my voice and I'll sing. Jesus is wonderful, yes, he is wonderful. Jesus is wonderful to me. He is the King of Kings, Prince of Peace, my everything. Oh, he is wonderful to me. Yes, Jesus is wonderful to me. Think about how good it's been. Pick me up some time again. Gave me a new song to sing. I don't deserve his love and grace, but on the cross he took my place. That's why he is wonderful to me. Jesus is wonderful. Yes, he is wonderful. Jesus is wonderful to me. He is the King of Kings. Prince of peace, my everything. Oh, he is wonderful to me. Yes, Jesus is wonderful to me. Yes, Jesus is wonderful to me. Oh, you need one. All right, he is wonderful, isn't he? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand up and let's sing about him. Let's sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There is a name. 
my love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Sing it out now. Sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, he tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. He tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. Because he first loved me, he tells me what my father has in store for every day. And though I tread a dark path, you'll sunshine all the way. Sing it out. Sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. How I love Jesus because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Sing it out. Sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Amen. Let's sing. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return. And come with singing unto Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return, and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Sing it out now. They shall attain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall be away. And come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Amen. All right. Did we have any birthdays this week? I think I forgot last week also. So if you had a birthday last week or this week or an anniversary, now's your chance to tell. Kayla? All right. Come on up. have any very good candy, Caleb, so I hope you like them. Hope not. Okay. Okay. There you go. Your kids will appreciate you later. All right, let's sing happy birthday to Miss Kayla. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday. Can I have all the younger kids come forward and just kind of spread out across the front? I want, I want some help on this next song. It's pretty quiet up here. These teenagers are not singing very loud. And I feel like I'm singing all by myself, so it would be nice to have some help in here this morning. We're going to sing I'll Fly Away. Spread on out on this side too, guys. There you go. Keep it at least six inches apart, all right? <laughs> let's, let's sing I'll Fly Away. Here we go. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore.
fly away. Like a bird from prison bars and slow down. Fly away. Oh, I'll fly away. Oh, glory, I'll fly away. And when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. And just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. Dismiss us this morning. Amen. You are dismissed. Please walk. morning good morning good morning and good morning philippians chapter 4 if you'll head over there with me thank you for being here today thank you for those that will be uh that are online and will be online it's uh great to have you today put a comment in there let us know where you're from if you're listening in and uh encourage one another thank you for those that have been praying for um uh, Miss Woody, she is still in ICU and beginning the slow process of healing, uh, doing well after her surgery, um, probably will be in Anchorage um, at the hospital for another four to five days, so hopefully out of ICU today and in, in the PCU, and then, uh, and then probably another week after that just to be up in Anchorage uh, for another week to be near the hospital, but be praying. It's a slow recovery and process, and as Matt mentioned and was praying for Gary, I was chatting with him early this morning. I said, Gary, you be a good passenger riding back home. He's going to get released today at noon, and a gooder recovering hip replacement patient. And he said, I'll be gooder, <laughs> exclamation mark. So it's good to chat with him and then be praying for uh, Josie and those little babies and for Miss Janet as she uh, gets ready to go in. For surgery this next week. So, well, today we're going to take a look at Philippians. If you'll go there, let's look at uh, these first three verses in chapter four. Remember, Paul, sitting in prison, writes a letter to these believers in Philippi to encourage them and remind them that as they live out their life, do that in a way that's becoming to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be careful about the things you think on. Be careful about the things that you are involved in. And Paul, through all of this, will have some warnings, warnings against false teachers. But as he writes, he's really encouraging them that you can find joy even in the midst of difficulties, the difficulties of life, no matter what comes your way. And it all deals with the focus of what you and I think on each day as we go through the challenges of life. Today, as we look at chapter 4, Paul is going to have... Uh, I would use the word admonition, counsel or warning. He says, hey, listen up. This is some important stuff. And it's going to be specific. And the, um, the challenge for you and I will be 
how you and I apply the truth of God's Word in obedience this week and the things that will come our way. So let's look at the Scriptures, and then we're going to go to, to the Lord in prayer. Chapter 4, just going to read the first three verses. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for really this encouraging passage of Scripture and the challenge to us as we walk through this life, are we walking by faith? As we strive toward things, are we st striving toward those things that will eternally make a difference? And Lord, help us to see beyond ourselves and those that are connected with us through our families, through our church family, through those that God will allow to cross our paths. And Lord, as, as Paul again expresses his love and, and affection for these dear believers, Lord, he has to deal with some matters within the church. And uh, he'll give some admonition and some stern exhortation. And Lord, help us to learn from these truths today. And may you be honored and glorified in all that is said and done. I pray you'd loose your truth now, bind the enemy, and uh, just work in our hearts. Thank you for uh, this truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Paul is going to love on these people with truth, and that's a hard thing. I mean, it's one thing when things are going well in your life or my life to love on others. But there are times when others uh, may not be so lovely, and it becomes more difficult. That can be within the context of your family your church family, where you work, your community, no matter where you are. And Paul is going to speak some truth and love to a couple of women that are within the body of Christ. We know them by name because he's specific in calling them out. But there's not a lot that you find outside this passage of Scripture uh, that gives us insight to who these women are. So because of that, you and I have to put on our detective hats and figure out from what's said or what's not said from what Paul teaches about what's going on. So we'll do that. And uh, we'll look at a couple of thoughts today of how Paul will admonish these believers. And the first thing that we find here, if you go back to chapter 4 here, Paul says this, I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche. He uses that word, listen, <clears throat> we might use the word beg. Now, that gives a different connotation than just, hey, can I have your attention here? Uh, so when Paul says, listen, I, I admonish you, I, I beg you, I beseech you, he says, I beseech you, Odeus, and beseech Syntyche. Notice that Paul entreats both of them specifically, and I think he does that for a reason, because he wants to grab the attention of these two women, and by using uh, this verb the way he does, He's addressing both women together, and I think that's important in the way that he does this, and he's not looking to see who's to blame here. He's just going to draw attention there because they both need to take notice of, a, of what he's about to tell them. Now, as I mentioned, other there, if, you, you know, if you did a search or you just went through your entire Bible, you're not going to find outside of this context much about these women. So what is it that we can... Uh, deduct, surmise from what we just read. This is where you put on your detective hat. And this is where I'm going to pause, and you're going to help me out. So, what would you, what could we uh, conclude about these two women? There's a dispute. There's some kind of a disagreement within the body of Christ. That gives us some insight. Yep. Go ahead. Paul speaks the truth in love. If, if it were a doctrinal issue, if you go back to the book of um, Romans, he's very clear. Mark them 
and don't have anything to do with them. And that's my kind of paraphrase. So, but we don't find that in here about these two women. So it's probably not a doctrinal issue, these two women within the body of Christ. So they're members probably within the body of Christ at Philippi, not outsiders who have come in and are causing some issue. What else can we conclude or figure out about these two women? Yeah, go ahead, Beth. They were involved in laboring with Paul to strive for the gospel, to carry that forward. Now, we don't know what part, but we will be able to figure out some things from fellow laborers, the terms that he uses. So what do you think the dispute may be over, or does it really matter? Go ahead, Sally, you were going to say. Yeah. Whoever these two women are, I won't use the term leader, although that's probably it, but they have influence in such a way in the body of Christ that Paul says, listen, here's a warning to you two. I'm not going to focus on the blame, who's to blame, but I'm going to address both of you. And I think that's insightful for you and I. Oftentimes as we, you know, I don't know how many, probably hundreds of times you read over a verse but you don't really stop to think about what's going on. And by application, you may think, well, that's great. What in the world does that have to do with me? Listen, we all have our realms of influence within your own families, within the body of Christ, within your workplace, whether you're the owner or you, you work for someone, you all have an area of influence with the people around you, and it can cause disharmony. But by application for you and I, when it takes place within the body of Christ, it can affect what God wants to do through the members of that body. I love that about the scriptures, how Paul would teach that we are members, and he likens the human body to people that make up the body of Christ. Eyes, nose, mouth, ears, uncomely parts, but there's a portion of that scripture that says that God hath placed the members in the body in a way that pleaseth him. And so every member within the body of Christ is important. In fact, he would teach in that same passage, the uncomely parts we are to really lift up. We tend to focus on the more verbal, the more obvious, the more upfront parts of the body, and we should. But there's much that Paul will try to deal with here to, to warn these women. So we find here it's a very personal warning, a very personal warning. And, and uh, <clears throat> the other thing, if you go back to chapter 4, look at verse 2, I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Paul not only uh, gives a personal warning, but it's a very pointed warning. The things that you think about, the things that you're involved in, the things that you have influence over, and those you have that you influence, whether you realize it or not. Do you realize people watch you? I don't care who you are within the body of Christ or where you, in your mind, put yourself. Well, I'm kind of an unimportant part because I don't really do anything in the body of Christ, or I only do this. Every, people are watching you and me, the way you raise your family, the way you interact in the community, the way you work with others in the community, the way you respond to certain things, people knowing that you even go to that church, Resurrection Bay Baptist Church, people are watching you. And the question is, as Paul gives this very pointed mar uh, warning that they be of the same mind in the Lord, it's important about what you and I think and are involved in within the body of Christ. Because it does affect everyone around us. When we fall in that trap, well, what difference do I make? It affects the body. When I, figure, when I, when I in my mind, wake up and go, I'm just too tired to go today. Uh, you know, what difference will it make? Nobody's going to even miss me at church. It affects the body of Christ. You and I will go through life struggles, and what we tend to do, what our enemy will try to influence to 
is to think, well, man, if I let people know what I'm thinking and going through, I, it's unique to me. No, it's not. The things that you and I will struggle with within our families and just the simple fact of raising children, having to figure out how we're going to make ends meet and take care of everything, it doesn't take long if we remove Jesus out of the picture to think, I'm all alone here. And that's exactly where our enemy wants to get us, thinking we're all alone and just isolate us and cut us. So we, you, within the body of Christ, it's important. And Paul here says, listen, have, have the same mind in the Lord. Paul beseeches them to be of the same mind. Now, the reality is we all have opinions. <laughs> And we all think, well, if people would just do this in government and politics, it would turn this country around. If they would just, if my boss would just recognize this and do this, this whole workplace would change. And yeah, those things may be true. We all have opinions. But I think there's the, the principle that Paul is dealing with here sometimes not letting our opinions, even though they may be just, not exceed the bounds of modesty. You see, Paul would teach this principle of modesty. Do all things with modesty, the way I dress, the way I speak, the way I live life. And I think by application, the same principle is true here as Paul gives this, this pointed warning to be of the same mind. Now, it's interesting if you go back to just chapter 2, go back there and look at verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be, what's the next word? Like-minded. There's that same word, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Verse 3 in chapter 2. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. You find here that same word used over and over and over again. If you go back to uh, chapter 1, look down at ver or look up at verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Go over to chapter 3. For a minute and jump down to verse um, 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, Paul said, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Paul wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Look down at verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. Jump down to verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if any thing... Any Thing, ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even unto you. Verse 16, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. All throughout this letter, Paul again and again and again will deal with the very pointed warning about the things we think about within the body of Christ, how that will affect not only the body, but your family and every aspect of your life. So as we walk through this life, here's the application. Do we even, is it even on our radar that we are to strive together as we go through this life? 
You and I will go through ups and downs of just living life with health issues, with life decisions, with the everyday mundane. You know how we just kind of put just the grind of the day of raising families and going to work and paying bills. Do we even recognize that we are to yoke up and strive together? Paul says, listen, be of one mind. The beauty of knowing Christ, of believing on Jesus and having a personal relationship with Him, is that relationship connects us to one another in ways that cannot be understood outside of not knowing Jesus. It's the way that will connect us in a way that gives us meaning and purpose, not only in our life, but in our family, within the context of who we are in Christ, in the body of Christ. And even as believers, if we're not walking in that relationship and realize the connection, the joy, the adventure, the anticipation, it just won't be there. It's just, an, well, I showed up at church. I hope I get something out of it. Bless the Lord. Did you see Jake up there playing? I love it. He goes, oh, did you catch this? Now, if you don't play guitar, you probably didn't catch this. I don't have my capo. You know what that means? It's in a different key. And he looks right over and just goes, let's sing. And boom, off they go. I don't know about you, that's exciting. These little, these little guys coming up and singing. But if we weren't here today, maybe you're online and you got to see that. That encourages you to see another generation. And the part that you and I play in that is how we encourage them, the things that we say. If we're not like-minded, if we don't take this by application, we'll just focus on our little islands, our families, what we're going through, hope I can make it another day. And I'm not, listen, life is difficult and it's overwhelming and it can become discouraging when we forget about in our weakness, we can find strength in yoking up and walking with Jesus. So Paul, he says, listen here, be of the same mind. Go over to Philippians chapter 2 for a minute and go down to verse 14. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. It's not only just a pointed warning, but Paul is going to say, listen, the way we live our life ought to be a life of unity. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do, what are the next two words? All things. Good night. Paul, did you have to inspired by by the very breath of God, put all things there. Do all things. Do all things. The things that you look at as important, that you desperately need an answer to. The things that are mundane and thought, that are just part of the normal grind. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Why would Paul warn and exhort that. Well, look at the next part of the scripture. That ye may be blameless and harmless sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain neither labored in vain. Listen, as we Strive together within the body of Christ. Encourage and pray to lift up, to weep with those who weep, and to laugh with those who laugh, to go through the highs and lows. We're in this together. And as we do that, we are to be lights to those that will watch you and I as we live out life. There, people are just looking for honesty. Honesty. Well, I'm having a bad hair day. Well, that's good. But the question is, is will I walk by faith on the bad hair days and respond in a way that reflects who my Savior is? We have good days and bad days, and some days our days are so bad, we just get up on the wrong side of the bed. Can't do that in some houses. You just smack into a wall. But you get up, 
<laughs> the wrong words come out, the wrong thoughts come out, the wrong actions come out. We have days like that. But Jesus, in our weakness, in our... Now catch this. Here's the principle. What we think is important in our opinion that would cause a dispute, maybe that needs to be toned down a little, Paul would say. Paul would, he wouldn't say it in that such a diplomatic way. He'd just say, hey, hey, I beseech you, Beth. I beseech you, you put your name in there. He just calls them right out in love. Be of the same mind. Listen, when Jesus gathered his disciples together before he was going to be allow himself to be arrested, falsely accused, beaten, crucified, give up his life so he could say it is finished through his death and his shed blood so that he could demonstrate the power over death and pay for sin's penalty through his shed blood and rise from the dead. It is finished. He said, guys, here's a new commandment that I give you. You've heard this. I, I love this passage of Scripture, that ye love one another. I can just see him like, do what? We know a lot of the commandments, but love one another? And then Jesus would say this, as I have loved you. He says, let me, Jesus said, be the example. As I have loved you, that ye love one another. By this shall all men, everyone that's watching you. You want to know how people know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? If ye have love one for another. That is an incredible truth that Jesus would challenge those that followed him physically on the earth and afterwards, because it was that very thing that would make a difference in the lives of everyone they lived around that would cross their path. What is different about these people? There is something different about them. The Roman government can't fix everything. The Roman government hates what they stand for, but they're still loving one another and helping other people along the way and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and seeing lives changed and helping in those lives, it made a difference then. It makes a difference now. The question is, is many times we will get just overwhelmed with the things of life or just in the daily grind and it's just not even on our radar the impact that you have in the lives of other people, the part that you play within the body of Christ as you live out your life. But people are watching you. And Jesus said, listen, be a light, be salt. Go, if you would, uh, go over to Psalm 119. We'll just go over here for a second. Psalm 119 And uh, go down to verse 165. Here's what the Bible says. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You ever get offended? Ah, man. And something inside of you just Bubbles up to the top. You don't talk to me that way. You don't talk to my family that way. You don't treat the person I love that way. You don't understand and see the way I see things in this situation. And pretty soon, there's a dispute. That's where we find these two women. And Paul is just simply going to say, listen, be careful. Be careful. All right. We're going to go on to the next point. I think we got that warning. The next part of this, go back to Philippians for a minute, chapter 4. Isn't that a great problem when the sun comes up and it's so bright? You're out there. Philippians chapter 4, and go down to verse 3. And I treat thee also, true yoke fellow. Help those women 
which labored with me in the gospel. You see, the work here that you and I are to play a part in is important and serious work. In fact, it will change the eternity of the people that God will allow to cross your path. You think about that. The eternity. God may open a door, provide an opportunity for someone to cross your path. Maybe once and only once. Maybe a few times. Years apart. That can make a difference in the eternity of where an individual will spend either in the presence of God or in death forever separated outside of the presence of God. And you see here, it's, it's a serious work. And when Paul uses this word, yoke fellow, he's purposely using this word that draws a picture of oxen, because back then, before power equipment and machinery, you know, you just hop in that front, front end loader, four minutes, my entire driveway is cleared of snow. I mean, wet, heavy snow. Four minutes! Paul is using a picture of oxen who would be yoked together that would try to break up the hard ground that would take days or weeks by hand that would seem daunting, impossible. He would say, fellow laborers, are we yoked up together, striving for the gospel. And Paul here, we see here, he draws attention to the seriousness of this picture of a team of oxen harnessed together, pulling together. But look what he says here. I entreat thee also, true yoke fellows, yoke fellow, help those women. He's very practical here. Take hold together with one another, come alongside one another, and assist, help them. He doesn't draw attention to what they're the root of the dispute or who's to blame. He says, listen, you've labored with me. These women have labored with me, striving together for the gospel. There's an issue here, and I want you to be a help to them. You know what we often do? Well, pff, it's not my problem. <laughs> they're having a problem with their family? Oh, yeah, I'll pray for them. But, and we should pray. And I'm not trying to discount or lower that prayer is not important. But we tend to avoid conflict. Who likes to go through and jump into a hornet's nest? Well, pff, if I just go in there and try to help in some way, be an encouragement, I might get stung. Yes, you may. But you think about your own families and the children within the context of your immediate realm. You will love them in truth. Yeah, you'll have bad hair days. I mean, days where you... It never happened in my family, but, you know, screaming at your kids? Yeah, right. You're going to have days. I used to tell my wife, you can't tame a tornado. You can't. Don't even go there. Those homeschool years when the principal would come home at lunch and have to fix things or remind people. We will have difficulties, but the question is, will we be a help? Will we be a help within this context? Look over we're in the neighborhood. Go to Galatians, Galatians chapter 6. <coughs> How do we help? Well, look what the Bible says. Galatians chapter 6. Go down to verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are, what's the next word? Spiritual, you think you've got it all figured out? Now listen, when Paul uses the term spiritual, he's talking about those who are following Jesus by faith, who can take the word of God and rightly divide it and apply it in wisdom. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one, be a help, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Verse 2. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, sometimes people just need to hear, because you've gone through it, raising kids is tough. It's challenging. They will break your heart. The things that you're going through right now, listen, if you will just rest in trust and what God has given you, 
and trust him enough to cry out to him and, tr and take his word and apply it in practical ways. And sometimes you're the one that you allow to come alongside someone else to be able to show by example, because you've been there, to be a help, to restore, to encourage, to yoke up with others so that they can move, because we are in this together within the body of Christ. And it's amazing to me how Paul will just draw attention to the seriousness of the work in, in promoting and sharing the gospel, how we play a part in it, and to come along and be a help to these women. Go over to, um, right after the book of Philippians, is the book of Colossians. Chapter 3, look at verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of, on the earth. Jump down to verse 12. Put on, therefore, now in between those verses, there's a whole lot of stuff of, to put off. But verse 12, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectedness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be, thank, be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, do, do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. There is so much packed in the Scripture that you and I, if we will, by faith, try to live out in the power, not in the, our power, but in the power of God to encourage others. All through the Scriptures. There may be times where your opinion is right and just. But do it in moderation. Speak truth and love and be a help. The eternity of those little ones and who when they grow up one day will have an influence on their siblings, on those the next generation that comes and the next generation and the next generation is being determined by how you and I live today. We, we typically will not think beyond the day or this coming week, let alone what God could do through you and I and the generations that will come after us. It's a serious work. And Paul, as he says here, we need to help. Look back, if you would, in Philippians chapter 4 here, because he also says here, labored. I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me. You see, that's where we get that term, striving together, yoking up with one another. Because the difference is an eternal difference in what we do with this gospel message. If, you, if there's been a point in your life where you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the beginning of a relationship that has forever changed your eternity and can change your present by having life and life more abundantly. And the question is, in this work of striving together within the body of Christ, encouraging one another within the body of your own family and the lives of other people, it's Jesus that will make a difference. Isn't it crazy? We hear that all the time. We can see it in the truth. And yet if we are just hearers of the word, we just deceive ourselves. And we wonder, why am I missing joy? Why is there no adventure in life? Why don't I get excited about anything? Maybe I've become dull to the truth of God's word. The strength that you and I need and the help that we find is found in knowing Christ and in his truth. The very words that he spoke. 
And so Paul just simply tells them, strive together. Be a help to one another. Am I striving together? Don't fall into the trap. Well, I just don't, you know, I don't teach a class. I'm not the pastor. I, I can't plink a note out on any kind of an instrument or sing on tune to anything. What difference do I make in the body of Christ? Every difference. And God has something specific for you and I within the body of Christ. Are we striving together? Maybe you're like, I don't, well, I don't know what that is. Well, ask God. Go to the preacher. Preacher, what can I do within the body of Christ to help? There's so much that can be done. Some of the first converts that Paul is writing to, remember when he showed up? You go back to Acts chapter 16 and he shows up. He goes down to the river. And who's there? A woman by the name of Lydia who hears the gospel message, who had an awareness of God and knew of God, but for, heard for the first time Jesus. And the Bible says that she believed and was baptized and her family. There are other women there that day. That was the beginning of a work. And you might look at that and go, well, a couple of women down at a river? That's no big firework display start of a work in Philippi that would forever change the course of women and children and men and other people who had passed through Philippi. The work is serious, and Paul, as he says here, strive together, strive together. And then finally, see if we can get to this last point. Let's look at, uh, go back to Philippians chapter 4 and look at uh, this latter part of verse 3 here. <clears throat> I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. God knows the names of all his children. Amen? He, he knows you and I better than we know ourselves, or will ever know ourselves. And you'll notice in here, Clement and others are named in the book of Philippians. And I think that's important. But more importantly... Their names are written in the book of life. And the question is, your name written in the book of life? Well, how does that happen? That happens when we come to the realization, no matter what our past is, I'm lost. I am spiritually lost. And you see for the first time a Savior, and His name is Jesus. The one who came and bled and died not only for your sin, but to give you life to allow you to escape a second death, who in darkness would show light and bring restoration through His shed blood. The day that you believed on Jesus, boom! That was the beginning of a relationship. And that day that you believed on Christ, our names, they now depending on how you view the Scriptures, if they were in the book of life and blotted out or written in the book... They are in the book of life. So we find here a specific name and a specific record, the book of life. Listen, it's always scary when I show students about not knowing anything of their past. What I can learn about them in three minutes. And I just begin to tell them all kinds of details, and they will look at you like, how in the world do you know maybe my name before I was married, where I lived, what children I have, what records are public that deal with illegalities? All kinds of your name shows up every... It's, we're way past the days of the phone book, can find your name, the who's who document. If you're on social media, your name is everywhere. The end of your life, people tend to go through and talk about all of who you were and how you were known. But for Paul, as he reminds these women and those that are laboring for the gospel message, 
He just boils it all down. Is your name written in the book of life? The people that you spend time with this week, are their names written in the book of life? You see, the warning Paul has, he talks about, listen, there will be names that are not written in the book of life. Let's look at a few passages and we'll finish this up. Go to the back of the book, Revelation chapter 17. Uh, let's go to 13 first. Do I have that? I do have that. Revelation 13, we're talking about a specific record. The only book that really matters is that book of life. Revelation 13, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. And we're talking about this false beast, but here's what I want you to catch. Whose names, whose names? Well, the Bible, those that were dwelling on the earth. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You see, there are names that are not there. Go over to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. And look at verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is and is and yet is and is not and yet is but there are names that are written in that book go to revelation chapter 20 <clears throat> Our time on earth is just but a fleeting vapor. Is your name written in the book of life? The people that you spend time with, is their name written in the book of life? If they die and pass from this world into eternity and have never believed on Jesus Christ, they will stand here that we find in Revelation 20, starting in verse 11, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the, what's the next word? Books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of which stack? The book of life? The Bible tells us. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works, which were written in those books. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When Paul <clears throat> would proclaim the gospel to someone who had never heard their need for a Savior, when Jesus would spend time with Nicodemus and would say, ye must be born again, that spiritual birth that, that happens on the day when you saw yourself lost and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus, because of the finished work, did something in you the beginning of that, resol that um, relationship. That was a spiritual birth. It's like a resurrection, the first resurrection. <clears throat> Those that stand before the great white throne, there will be a judgment. The difference when you and I remain silent will have an effect on someone's eternity. It's amazing. And how we will just compartmentalize ourselves into what difference do I make? What difference can I make in my church, with my family, in my community, in this state, let alone in the United States or on this planet? When you and I just simply trust Christ enough, not only for salvation, but just to allow him work in our lives that he might use us in the lives of others. 
we'll, the, one day when we stand, not before that great white throne, but when we go through that judgment, through the Bema Seat judgment, of how we lived our life from the day we believed on Jesus Christ, and the things that are eternal, that will last, will come out, the things that are temporal, that will be in that judgment, just be like a fire applied and just burned and go away, we will stand before and give an account. The account will be settled. The question is, is what will we do? What will we do with the time that we have left? Paul would say, listen, if your name's in the book of life, that is the beginning of a relationship that we oftentimes never really understand how that impacts our present day of who we are in Christ. And the impact Jesus can have in the life of someone else through you. I mean, we look at the preacher and we go, I get it. He's the preacher. I look at the evangelist and I go, I get it. That's what he does. But me? What, what about, who am I? We're nothing apart from Christ. But in Christ, <laughs> he is everything. What a challenge we find here in the Word of God. Listen, the work of the Lord is too great for you and I. We can't do it. It takes everyone. The, the strength to get up, the, the motivation to do, it comes from God. And we need His help. When frictions arise, am I going to have the mind of Christ? Am I going to want to even help? I may not be able to go there, be there presently, fix the situation. But hey, I can remind people of truth. I can lift them up in prayer. I can be a help. What will you do? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this challenging God's word to these women and to those within the body of Christ in Philippi, those that would labor and strive together to carry the, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, and the power of that resurrection in the lives of other people. Lord, help us, if you, as you have spoken to us this morning, in our hearts, just to be honest with you. We need your help. If I, if I just focused on today and this coming week, it is overwhelming. But Lord, when I'm reminded about who I am and whom I'm yoked up with, your peace comes and just washes over my concerns and anxiety and worries. My hope is in you. Lord, help us to walk by faith like that is truth on a day-to-day -day basis. We need your help to even do that. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for our preacher that will come in this next hour as we worship you. Lord, I pray that you would just give him boldness and strength to proclaim your truth. And Father, that you would loose your truth, that you might have your way in our hearts and your perfect will would be done. Thank you for those that have come out today. Lord, thank you for what you will do. Thank you for your faithfulness and your love for us and to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. We are dismissed.